This is The First Stop, a podcast with the aim of exploring the minds of artists in and around New Haven. I'm your host, David Livingston, an artist and educator at University of New Haven. In this episode, we'll navigate the mind of New Haven-based artist Monique Atherton. The works discussed in this podcast can be found on our blog at firststopart.com. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at firststop.art. Monique's uncompromising photographs of people and places explore past and present traumas of dislocation and abandonment. Many of them communicate an alienated sense of intimacy. They become explorations of an internal psychological landscape rather than just depictions of external experience. In her recent work, Monique has experimented with digital manipulation, creating surreal and haunting images that express the disorienting experience of processing loss. I was really struck by this description that you made about growing up in Bangkok and like having this urban, global, metropolitan experience. And then you you moved for some reason to Eastern Washington. (laughs) Like in the in rural Eastern Washington. I actually know in, in the middle of winter. In the middle of winter. And I just wanted to kind of ask you about that experience because you described it as a very formative experience and it seems like something that you still occasionally feed off of, or maybe it's something from the past. Um, but that it like made you think about the world in a different way. Yeah, you know, I didn't really think about it at the time of it happening. So I was 17, and we moved to this rural place (laughs) into a double-wide trailer on 20 acres. And, you know, I sounded American at the time, but not quite. The students in the public school kind of knew that I wasn't totally American, but they couldn't figure it out. And, I mean, they were okay. Nothing too traumatic happened um, at school, but just the move itself being yeah. in this metropolitan city of millions of people living in high rise, living a really fancy life, and then moving to the middle of nowhere um, really shaped my art practice, but it lay dormant for about, I would say, 10, 15, no, probably a good 10 years because I didn't really make art during that 10 years. And it wasn't until 2008 that I started really calling myself an artist. And then fast forward a few years, looking at my work, like, so I made work from 2008 to 2013, 14. And and around 2013, 14 is when I started seeing that I kept being drawn to these rural landscapes, um, Mm -hmm. especially out west. Mm -hmm. And... I think that was me reliving or trying to deal with the trauma of having been there. And it's also somewhat of a reconciliation. With that change, yeah. With that change and that experience. I found it really interesting because, you know, I was looking through the series that you've entitled First Avenue. Yes. And that is not the West, right? It's, it's, uh, It's right around here. Yes in the kind of New Haven, West Haven, Southern Connecticut area. Yeah. But it's a very, to me, it's a very desolate world. It's literally five minute walk from here. Not even yeah. five minute walk from where we physically are recording this. That is yeah. so funny. <laughs> I mean, I just, the especially this, this picture, I love this picture of the house. Ah, yeah. It's just this like straight on shot of the house and there's something very frank about it or something. Right. You're not like trying to sell us on some point of view. You're just like, look at this. This is a house. This is a yeah. house. But yet it captures this area so well to me. And speaking of the trauma of moving, this is a much smaller trauma <laughs> than like moving from Bangkok to Eastern Washington. But when I moved up to New Haven, just from New York, which was like two hours away, there was this kind of I felt like my brain was suddenly 
empty of stimulation mm -hmm. from the city. Yeah. And I just looked at the architecture is in some ways so like drab in a way here. But I also think that when you have these smaller moves, you don't expect like I expected some kind of weird culture shock yeah. moving from Bangkok to rural. You expect, like, right. It's so different. different you yeah. expect it. But when you move from New York to New Haven, you don't think there's going to be that. It's not going to be that big of a deal. You're just like, oh, whatever. Just moving two yeah. hours away. Yeah, yeah. And it is culturally so different. Right. And I think you get that all up and down the East Coast. Everything is so close, but each of these spaces have their own unique personalities and totally and elements that distinguish them from and each other. And out West, people are more accustomed. Like, it's a bigger space in mm -hmm. a way, and people drive two hours just to sometimes just to like go to the grocery store or like visit yeah you know or just for like a little day trip whereas in the east you know a two hour or three hour drive is a, like a really long time yeah i just know my my grandparents are from actually eastern washington what oh yeah. have we not had this conversation <laughs> no, no. before my dad oh. grew up in like bridgeport washington near wenatchee oh. uh yeah. yeah so I have one I, that also made it resonate for me when I was reading that, that you moved to that particular part of the world. Oh, have you actually, you've been there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. I like going back. I actually really love going back to Eastern Washington now. My parents yeah. still live in the same place. Why did your parents move there? Like, why move from Bangkok uh -huh. to Eastern Washington? So, my dad is American. Yeah. And he actually grew up. In the Philippines. I see. Came back to the States for a minute and then was drafted to Vietnam. And oh. then spent a career in the military. I and so see. I think he was having midlife thoughts and, yeah. and was like, I want to go live in the U.S. I'm American. I've never lived there before. And wow. so he brought us kids there. <laughs> That's intense. That's, ama <laughs> That's an amazing story. Like, Yeah. So his midlife crisis basically yeah, like uprooted your entire it. life. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I would say. I mean, and and it's interesting because I've had a number of midlife crises. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> crises. Crises. Yeah. Um, myself, and I've moved around a lot, and I guess the difference is I don't have children to drag around. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, I'm actually really thankful for that move. Mm -hmm. 20 years later, I can say that I am really thankful because it's been such an important part of my art practice. I think yeah. the examination of other spaces and my presence in space is mm -hmm. really important to me, both as an observer and as a participant. So, right. Um, because all the West Haven, the First Avenue work was my neighbor. So the house picture we're talking about uh, was my neighbor's house. And I met her on Craigslist. Funny. And she's like, oh, the house next door is open. You want to move in? And so I <laughs> moved into the that house is next so to funny. her. And a lot of the work, actually, a lot of the work, so that is First Avenue and West Haven, but it's also mixed with a few images from Eastern Washington here and there, too. Interesting. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. But the house is definitely on First Avenue and West Haven. Just thinking about what we're talking about with you moving and that whole experience, in a lot of these images, there is both a sense, there's a kind of a simultaneous sense of alienation and intimacy, like a connection in the images. Welcome to my life. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, one of the most striking images in here is is this one with this guy who clearly, like, is... Yeah. Brain surgery. Had yeah. brain surgery, which is... And this, like, I don't know, there's something so... Can you tell this, tell a story behind that image? Or is it a private kind of story? I, I probably shouldn't talk about his own story, but he's somebody that I've known for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a friend of my younger brother. And oh, okay. I think he kept having to have these brain surgeries, and hopefully this is the last one. And yeah. Um, I just went and spent some time. This was the day after the last one he had. Yeah. Uh, and it just so happened the timing was that was the only time we could go see him. 
Yeah. And he was already out of hospital. And um, I just was really, I've always been interested in, I mean, I think just visually scars yeah. are interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and he's such a part of my life in a weird way. He's been this kind of side figure. character, side figure since 1997. Wow. He was my brother's best friend from the time they were really little. Like, I don't know how even how old they were, maybe six, seven, eight, I don't know, young. And so is this shot from Washington or? F this is in Washington, yes. Cool. Yep. So it's in their apartment and it's him and his wife. And yeah, in one way it was a celebration, you know, because he mm -hmm. got this scar, sure, and he had this brain surgery, but at the same time it's, it's he's alive and he's able to stand up and mm -hmm. take a hug from her, so. Yeah, but I think it's also a metaphor for the scars that we all <laughs> carry we around. Care, and then yeah. that one is eventually you won't see it because his hair hair is going to grow in, yeah. And, um, yeah, to me, there's such a kind of like tenderness mm -hmm. in the way that his wife is embracing him. It seems like this very poignant moment. Was it something that you staged with them or was it like a moment that you captured? I just um, asked them. Actually, no, I think they were standing like that. I, yeah. I think I asked her to stay a little longer and hug him yeah. and let me photograph them. But it was a natural thing that was happening at the moment I decided to ask them to make the images. So, And she's also extremely photogenic, too. Yeah, <laughs> right. Can you talk more about who these characters are and how you're lighting each image? Like, do you change the lighting at all, or are you just kind of capturing? It's a little bit of both. I have yeah. a secret, well, it's not that secret. I use off-camera flash a lot. I really like that. So mm. I have a wireless transmitter on my camera. And it flashes from a different location. Right, usually I hold yeah. the flash uh, above my head, mm -hmm. pointing at the subject, usually mm -hmm. off to one side. Mm -hmm. And um, the people, I just feel like living in that area on First Avenue, it was such a transient area. My neighbor had a lot of people in and out of her house. We had so random a bunch of different characters. people coming and asking us things because it, it was a really prominent area. It was right off the freeway. There were only two houses there. They're both actually abandoned now or mm. vacant now. Um, I don't think they're renting them anymore. Um, but yeah, they there were just uh, so many characters coming and going, and I got to know a lot of them and and got as close as you can get to people coming and going. Yeah. Do you know why so many people were coming and going, or what she, did you kind of figure out? My neighbor was just a very kind person, and she mm -hmm. knew people who needed a place to stay yeah. and. Yeah, sometimes they would just come out of prison or mm -hmm. they were foster kids that they they weren't foster kids anymore, but you know, they didn't have people with no family or nowhere to go and sometimes people would just help out on special projects that we'd be working on um dealing a lot of with antiques or, or mm. you know, buying and selling things. So you would need manpower to kind of help put yeah. things away and sort things and prepare for sales and so so there were just um, a cast of characters who I got to know and really like, and yeah, um, I think that's why it was. It took me uh, quite a while to edit this series because after a while you begin to care about people and you right. don't want to make them. There's a certain dignity you want to preserve with your Total, absolutely the yeah people you photograph, and so um, that's really important to me. These characters, they are clearly people who've lived a lot or had a lot of hardship, it seems like, mm -hmm. in their lives, or their faces have sort of these expressions of, like, I've been through a lot. Yeah. To me, it's interesting because, you know, you are, you're sort of, again, like an insider and an outsider in the scenario because you're right. living with them. Exactly. But you're not exactly from the no. same place as them, and you don't have the same story as them. Exactly. And I think there's a lot of photography out there where the photographer sort of puts people either 
puts them on a pedestal mm -hmm. or makes them into sort of like ruins porn kind of stories like right. look the at other people the yeah. othering you know? yeah and you sort of like kind of look at it and are like oh that's so messed up you know in yeah. that way where you but i don't get that from these images there's they're very raw you sort of have to identify with the person and i like that you're not glorifying them and you're not looking right. down upon them it's a really fine balance and it's yeah. really really hard i think that's one reason it's like i've get stuck on certain projects yeah. because I don't. And, and that's another reason I've always incorporated myself is because I just don't want to be another photographer putting out images, othering people. We already yeah. have so much division in our world. We don't need to divide it even more. So how do you, I mean, you must take a bunch of, you take a lot of photos, thousands, right? You thousands. take thousands and thousands of photos and you've described, right? You spend hours and hours editing and it's turning into years sometimes year, yeah. yeah so you just now go... we've crossed the years threshold i think back then it was hours days, can you describe but... that process because that's in a way a creative process as well right yeah deciding what's not going to be included oftentimes i have a gut reaction like oh this is going to be the one and then yeah. so i have to live with it so i print it out i look at it i i tend to print out the best you know, the top few hundred from Walmart or Walgreens, just really cheap four by six prints. And then I live with them. Yeah. I have them in my bag. I have them on the wall. Um, then I relook at them online. I go back and forth. I use the editing software to, you know, like a book template to see how they'll speak to each other in a book. Interesting. So wow. hmm. it's, yeah, the shooting process doesn't take that long for me. I mean, yeah, you can shoot thousands of images in not that long of a time, but it is over days or over... I do shoot over years, but I'm not, like, shooting 12 hours a day. I yes. shoot maybe, like, 10 to 20 minutes a day, mm -hmm. and then I'll just have a lot of images to work from. That's that's if I'm living somewhere. If I'm traveling, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. I'll shoot a lot more during the day if I'm traveling. Can you talk about, for instance, I don't know, this little boy reaching for, <laughs> for his like <laughs> shoulder funny. blade? So this is when I was in Washington State, yeah. and um, my sister-in-law is from a small town in Washington. Well, she's not from there, but she has affiliations with a small town called Twisp, Washington. Okay. Uh, have you heard of it? Um, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I have, to be honest, I'm not. Not very familiar with it. It's a little like ski resort town, okay. but we were there off season. Um, so up in the hills. Up in the hills. It's yeah. absolutely stunning there. And my sister-in-law, her grandfather actually was living there. And so she and my brother were living there. So I got to spend about a week and I just met different people. She introduced me to a bunch of family, friends of family and I went to this one family's house and I was just like, hey, can I just take pictures of you all and hanging out? And you know, just visited with yeah. them, talked. Um, the kids showed me different things that they had. And, you know, I photographed this boy. He had all these trophies he was showing me. And then his sister was showing me her artwork. And, you That's know, cute. I, um, but then he did this thing with his shoulder blade and it just jutted out. <laughs> <laughs> and they just, it was one of the few non-posed images I had of this mm. this hour I visited with them. And it was my favorite one. And it's so snapshotty, but it just somehow works really well. We haven't talked about your most recent work, but it makes me think a little bit about how you're now actively trying to distort images because it has this look of like um, almost like a deformation even yeah. though even though it's not it's just right there's kind of a like it looks alien to him or something or like it does you know <laughs> it looks like a photoshop liquify tool has been used on it yeah right like you could just see somebody have been taking the brush and pulling it over <laughs> and the hard <laughs> shadow that it's casting is like this <laughs> void kind of into like how you know, how far does that right. darkness go for, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in, I don't have all my series up online, but I have probably five series that I consider to be 
finished complete bodies of work mm. and they all feed into the next one so it's a constant evolution i hope it's an evolution <laughs> so yeah. what was between these first avenue photos and then you starting to collage and play with filters what was the sort of medium between those two bodies mm. of work I felt like I needed a break from straight photography. I felt like that wasn't capturing how I was feeling during the making of that work. So the the series we're talking about is uh, Bad Faith. Mm -hmm. And it is work that was made between 2016 to 2018. And I used old photographs, outtakes, because I kept looking at these outtakes and wishing they were better photographs. Right. And they weren't. <laughs> and right. so I started fiddling with them. And I said, oh, well, what if I layer this here? What if I add this shadow here or distort mom a little bit <laughs> here right. or add a cat? Um, so this one here with the... This is your mother, yes. what, the woman who is surrounded by cats that are kind of. There's only two, I think. But you in just the multi photograph. you multiply. I them, multiply right? yeah. them sloppily yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the beauty of this project for me is that it forces you to look a little bit harder because I think the average person. I don't even know the stats now, but back in the day, it wasn't very long. It was a split second. You look at an image and move on. Right. And I think with these images, it's it forces you, it rewards you, I would hope, if you spend some time looking longer. At first glance, it might look like a lady with a bunch of cats, but then, mm -hmm. then you can continue to see that, oh, wait, there aren't a bunch of cats. There's just clones of cats. Clones of cats everywhere. Why is this artist doing this? <laughs> One of the ones that when we were in, all of us were in your studio looking at was this, uh, this image that it looks like a bunch of elderly people. I don't know. I assume they're like playing bingo or something. At, at, I don't know where it, it actually is, but it's so weird because it doesn't have this immediate like look of, oh, somebody messed with this. Right. It looks and, like a shitty photo. It, yeah. it looks like a shitty photo of an event that somebody, you know, took to capture yes. the the excitement of the <laughs> evening, right. which it was a very exciting evening. Um, I don't think the details of it necessarily matter for the public, but because right. to me, the image is like everywhere America. Yes. You know, it's totally. important that it's America. But yeah. it's it could be in the Elks Club here in uh, yeah. State Street in New Haven, but it could also be in Washington or Virginia or wherever. Absolutely, yeah. And so it wasn't so much uh, this body of work was very intuitive. It was very painterly. It's like mm -hmm. I've always wanted to be a painter, but I just don't have that desire to have to develop the skill set to paint like a proper painter. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, but so this is interesting because you mentioned you like the abstract expressionists. Is that true? You said that in an interview like a few years ago oh, about... Oh, God. Yeah, I should no, have like, read my old interviews. You, well, you <laughs> said, um, why am I... Oh, Philip Guston. Oh, yeah. And I he's like not that. really like in the middle of that. Like he sort of broke away right. from abstract expressionism. But you sort of think about him a little... A little bit in that context, right? What about his work do you do you love and how do you sort of see your work as feeding into some of that stuff that he's dealing with? I think he deals with that landscape, the psychological landscape. You know, I I've, I didn't know him, obviously. We actually only lived six months on this earth at the same time. He died six months after I was born. Um, but just I've always felt a kinship with his paintings. There's some desolation there and mm. it's grungy and dirty and mm -hmm. well, it looks grungy and dirty. Um, and I don't know. I think when I look at his paintings, I feel what I'm I empathize because it's what I feel. And I yeah. think that comes across in my work, too. I'm constantly analyzing what's going on in my mind and the stories that are going on in my mind. I can't even 
put out fully. Does that? I don't even know if the I'm making story. Yeah. Well, you you have a kind of you have an inner dialogue I that have, yes. you you sort of can't fully verbalize. Right. But it somehow is summed up in the visual images that you create. That I create. Yeah. I empathize with artists like Philip Gustin, with. Oh, yeah. Anna Gaskell was one of my early mm. influences. And she, are you familiar? No. Well, for those who aren't familiar with her work, she photographed a lot of young women, young girls, actually, in like kind of Alice in Wonderland style oh, outfits. Cool. And they're very colorful, you know, color film images with deep shadows and, mm -hmm. and kind of like this darker side of childhood. Yeah. You know, and I feel like I've always been drawn to that part of myself. Like to I don't think the darker part of childhood ever really left me. And yeah. then I think coupled with my life of constantly moving around and and not quite fitting in anywhere, you know, I'm part Asian and part white mm -hmm. and you know, I kind of am both, but I'm also neither, you know, right. so it's and, and I always manage to fit in wherever I go, but I always see everything through the eyes of an outsider. And yeah, I think that yeah. uncanniness, there's an uncanniness to it, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's this phrase, this it's kind of an old man joke. Um, I, I use the initials NKR for not quite right. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. It's a dorky joke. But that's that's how I feel about my work. Things Very are not interesting. quite right. Um there's something darker going on underneath the facade or sometimes the it, it's just dark yeah and out there in your face and it's dark and there's no secret yeah. about it being dark but then there's moments i like to try and mix moments of beauty with moments of darkness i wanted to ask you about you and you mentioned this a little bit but i wanted to ask you about you using yourself as a subject in your own photography right and how that emerged for you like what what made you want to use yourself as the subject i mean you talk about photography right as this an expression in some ways of you like yeah. like you're working through something internally even when you're taking pictures of other people right yeah i think it's just such a personal act for me and i think there's a lot of responsibility yeah. that comes with photography and so I think going just real quickly back to that other photograph, I didn't want to just post a picture of random strangers who are enjoying a nice evening out. And I yeah. think that's one reason I blurred their faces. Yes. And then that, there were other reasons, but that was kind of one mm -hmm. one reasoning behind it. Um, the other reason, or I guess back to the self-portraiture, that plays into that because I feel comfortable because I'm the one giving myself permission to be put on display. I know my motives. And so I'm most comfortable being the star of my images. Yes. <laughs> well, and, and because I, you're messing with your own image rather right. than somebody else's. Exactly. Yeah. No. And it was just, it really started out of convenience. Mm -hmm. So I was there, you know, Anybody who's been creative and tried to get teams of people or even one other person to photograph. It's it. hard, yeah. You know, there's a lot of coordination. There's a lot of timing. Um, and I'm secretly lazy. And <laughs> so, yeah, I, I felt like I was there. And I also like the part where I can cut the middle person out and get straight to what I want to do. I don't have to direct mm -hmm. anybody. I know what I want to get out of this picture. Can you give an example of using yourself to get a certain effect out of a picture? I mean, I think there one that I can think of is you, um, you're like looking out a window of a hotel. Let's take that photo, you're, you've got like a cigarette in your hand and yeah. you're kind of staring out. Can you remember what you were thinking about or what kind of story you were trying to tell when you I think it was just a very performative. I mean, it was a moment I just, that was in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And I had just gotten off the plane and I couldn't believe I was in this different city in this hotel room. And um, I know at that point there were two people in my life that I was really thinking a lot about. And 
So like I've always been this kind of hopeless romantic. Right. With, you know, love and intimacy are yeah. really kind of important themes in my life and my work and you mm-hmm. know, the search for belonging and I think at that point I was in between lovers and <laughs> trying yeah. to figure out <laughs> what was going on and so my brother had flown me to Dubai and um for a rendezvous so that we could go to Thailand together. And nice. I it was just this this moment where my brother hadn't arrived yet and I was alone in this new city thinking about all these things and possibility and maybe pos- possibilities escape mm-hmm. um you know it's it's like this yeah it's it's a, never actually had this conversation about this this particular photograph before um like you haven't articulated i haven't articulated it and and it's also interesting because the photograph was 10 years ago now yeah that's a long time ago right? to really process what you were thinking about back yeah, then yeah but i remember i was i i know the players involved i know that there was heartbreak involved but then there was also escape because yeah. You know, there was a certain freedom about, hey, I'm going to Dubai and Bangkok and I don't need you or you. Yeah, <laughs> you <know? yeah. laughs> and and so yeah. And and I was always I I feel like I think I'm more content now, but for most of my life I was always looking for the next thing. Yeah. So looking out the out this window, looking at the light. I was it was always looking to go somewhere. Yeah. To be better to push myself further. So speaking, you know, t- about being like a ho- hopeless romantic and, you know, um when we go back to your most recent work, to me, it's a pretty haunting portrait of a world mm-hmm. in a way. Would you s- agree yeah. with that? And I Would think you- it was yeah. working through trauma. Yeah, working you know, through trauma, yeah. 2016 I- was probably the most traumatic year of my life for a yeah. number of, of reasons. And um, that work really helped me deal with it. You know, and, and it isn't just like a traumatic incident, it doesn't just happen and then you're okay. There's repercussions. You relive it over mm-hmm. and over and over again. And it's good to be aware that that happened mm-hmm. so you can get the help you need. <laughs> yes, totally. But at the same time, I, I um, you know, with my own art practice, it was a, a challenging time because I just couldn't bring myself to go and shoot. Right. Uh, you were tending to your wounds. I was tending to my yeah. wounds, but also my muses went there. Right. I, I was tired of self-portraiture. Uh, yeah. I, I really haven't made too many self-portraits in the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I started with more so. Sometimes I'll mm-hmm. insert myself here and there. But yeah, I was just having kind of a crisis of of everything. Yeah. I mean, every single possible thing that you can imagine was off balance, was off balance in my life. And so taking the old photographs in a way is like reliving that trauma that I was experiencing. Mm-hmm. Because between 2014 and 2016, it was a challenging period of time. Yes, I was making the First Avenue work, but there was so much work that I didn't like during that mm-hmm. period, and there were other things that were going on. So those images in in uh, First Avenue that I reconstituted for the last two years, mm-hmm. uh, I think, are my way of dealing with that incident or the incidences of 2016 and kind of pushing forward. It's like a way of seeing the past in a new new way. Yeah. Or it's or... almost like because there's tons of these that didn't make it. Yeah. So it was just a lot of it was very therapeutic, you know. I know no, <laughs> totally artists the... shouldn't say this, but it, it was a, there You're was not a lot the only of art artist therapy. <laughs> I there has to be like a driving force behind right. why you do art, yeah. right? And if you're not doing it for some form of therapy, even, I don't know. Yeah. I just feel like, well, I mean, you're working with yourself in a way as a subject. Yeah. And so I think it's interesting. And I don't think that the art is just like, oh, this is some, it becomes something right. different 
once you make the image in a way, right? Well, and it's also edited. So yeah. I allowed myself the freedom to yeah. play and to to have my therapy. But, you yeah. know, the the trained artist in me also did a careful curation of the images that I felt that would be useful to put out into the world. You yeah. know, I, I feel like when we put things out, it's of service to people. It's so Absolutely. other people can connect to the work. And I feel that a lot of people can relate to these images because it captures this dark place that is such a natural part of human experience. What do you hope a viewer gets out of these images? A, a sense of connection? I don't think I have a specific expectation of what somebody gets out of it. I just yeah. hope that somebody gets... I yeah. hope it goes to that place where people can relate and take away what they want from it. Because yeah. I feel like with art, with writing, with you know anything, we bring our own perceptions and experiences and project totally. onto that. Totally. So, I I think with any image, I hope that somebody will feel something by what I'm putting yeah. out. And I, I'd be happy if just one person yeah. did. I was looking through your work and I had this weird feeling of like, I don't know if this is what you want to hear, but I, first of all, they're super compelling images and I like couldn't stop looking at them, but I also felt this weird sense of dread yeah, I felt a sense of dread when I was like, I, for some reason, seeing some of those images, it gave me this weird childhood memory. Yeah. Where I, it's kind of a long winded story. I don't want to tell the mm -hmm. whole thing, but it was this kind of moment uh, in childhood where I sort of had to cope with mortality. Oh, yeah. And that feeling of like, oh, no, you don't live forever. <laughs> That theme I, is really prevalent in my work, and I, it's only maybe in the last two to three years that I've reconciled and I'm completely comfortable with the idea of death. Right. Um, I think for me, death was such a driving force, you know, and I don't know all the, the Freudian and <laughs> all yeah, those yeah, yeah. An analytical death drive type things. I mean, I kind of do, but that's my point is that I was I was raised very religious. And I think, okay. I think most people are raised with some sense of religion. I hadn't really ever thought about my work in that vein, but I yeah. can see how it's colored yeah. the work because it is a theme that I thought about for many years. As a person, you're saying? As just a person, not even as an artist. Just yeah. like, oh my God, is this air conditioner going to fall off this you know, oh, 10th okay. floor Got and, it. Got it. and hit me? I was like obsessed with, not obsessed, but preoccupied with the possibility of dying for many years yeah and um i've worked through it <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it must still be there a bit because it's, it's i don't think it own. ever can leave right? no it's just I, part of human experience i think once you accept the fact that we are all connected we're energy you yeah. know and and when our energy is done on this earth it just goes somewhere else it right. Goes, it it right. doesn't actually disappear. It, I guess when our energy in our current form is done, it just will dissolve into something else. And it's, yeah. it's okay. And I yeah, think that, yeah. like, looking at life as just the shifts and movement and change, it's, it's just such a amazing, I don't know, what's the word? It's an amazing uh, realization. Yeah. So, but... Yeah. I think. So some of these, I guess, you know, there are people, you know, sort of deformed mm -hmm. or like there's a sense of maybe decay occurring and right. stuff like that. But this was more pain. I think yeah, it pain, was just right. working through the most painful time in my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, and I needed to explore my image, I, you know, I was completely shattered. I was, I, I didn't know who I was anymore. And I think photography really helped kind of pull me back and work through it all. When, back when you were photographing yourself a lot and photographing the world that you lived in, mm -hmm. you described yourself as discovering that you felt alone mm. through your photographs. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah. 
I mean, is that something that does, when you look at images that you take and you look at images of your life, does it change the way you think about yourself at all? Or is that just a, maybe I shouldn't be quoting all these old Yeah, because it was so long ago. Yeah. It's like, uh, I feel, I mean, I yeah. feel like there was a lot, like that was pivotal time for me. Yeah. Like 2013. It was when I really found my voice as an artist. And it it's probably also one of my favorite bodies of work is from that time that, this Tacoma series, which isn't mm -hmm. really available online, but it was me and my former partner in the outs on the outskirts of Tacoma, Washington. Nice. And I feel for me that work was just completely uninhibited, and it was um, I don't know. It for me it was the strongest, or I guess the work that's nearest and dearest to my heart. You know. Yeah. And what about it is? I think that psychological freedom. Like I created this work of a world that I really want to live in. My reality right. wasn't like that, but in the images it was. Yeah. And so I was able to kind of have that perfect relationship. That's cool. In these images with no fighting and no, you know, I mean, yeah. I think originally I was interested in exploring the tensions and and unspoken things, the unspoken language between mm -hmm. lovers. Mm -hmm. But ultimately I think what came out of that body of work was the perfect relationship. It was an Im it was a set of images of the perfect relationship. You're saying, or it was did a, it create the perfect relationship? It created a perfect world yeah. where you see these two figures and their dog, mm -hmm. kind of gallivanting nude through the outskirts of Tacoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> Um, there's a certain degree of passion, I think, involved that they yeah. came out in, in that work. Totally. That that just was like, okay, the this is my idea of a perfect relationship. But right. but that's not the intent. You know, looking right. back I can say that. But um I think I was just trying to make work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something interesting to me and that was interesting yeah. to me. Because I do like kind of the grungy, outskirty looks. I'm totally. really drawn to that. I don't know why I totally. just really am. <laughs> you sort of lived in it, right, what? for a little bit. Definitely for the last three years yeah. in uh, West Haven. But I, I don't like to live like that, but I'm still drawn to those places. Yeah. And I think it, part of it is reliving or accepting the trauma of moving to rural Washington Yeah. State. <laughs> and and it wasn't, you know, the wealthiest place. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it was kind of the first time I was introduced to that landscape, to that Amer that part of the American yeah. landscape. At the time, it was miserable, but it's also evocative. The grunginess of... Yeah, like, I don't know why I just, aesthetically, I'm drawn to this grunginess and... I think I like gritty things. I think I don't like it when you're too polished because I have like a split personality because, mm -hmm. you know, if you see me, you're like, oh, she's so bougie. You know, I like my black dresses and hair pulled back tight. But I also there's this other side of me that just like like salvage yards and. Right. Um, yeah. And you sort of I mean, things. <laughs> right. And professionally, you've been, you know, in like business and stuff like that and right. been a kind of type A. Totally, you, completely type A. You're like a productive person yes. in the workforce. Yes. Yeah, I've always had these careers in finance, in trade. I was a trade lobbyist for Christ's sake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, is, what is the appeal? Like, how do you reconcile those two parts of yourself? I don't know because I've always had these fancy jobs. Yeah. But then I don't live in fancy neighborhoods because these fancy jobs that I have sound good, but they don't necessarily pay that well. And so um, I've always lived in kind of poorer neighborhoods. And um, that's actually my next project I'll be working on because I'm so tripped out by my current, the current state of my life, right? So I live in Cedar Hill, which is a small neighborhood, mm -hmm. upstate street, kind of nestled between 
East Rock Park and State Street. Mm -hmm. And it's one of four neighborhoods in New Haven that was cut off by the freeway. Mm -hmm. So I take the bus every day from this little neighborhood and then I go to my job you know, in a fancy area of downtown and work with some of the world's most richest and powerful people. And it's, I mean, obviously not necessarily directly, yeah, but sometimes but directly, world, yeah. but I'm in that world and I have access to those people. And it's incredibly trippy to sit there and think about it. And mm -hmm. so for me, I'm, I've, in the early stages of beginning work on examining my route between my neighborhood oh, cool. and Yale and then some offshoots here and there. So, um, do you drive? I don't. You I take the bus. I take the bus. I walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I've been trying to make more friends. I do have some friends on the bus that, you know, cool. we all know each other. And I've been kind of slowly, I think my process is a very long process. Right. <laughs> and right. I think in this particular process, there's going to be a lot more research involved because I'm interested in finding out why these neighborhoods got cut off and how the freeway has impacted them. Yeah. So I might expand to the other neighborhoods like the Annex That's cool. And... So do you think that if you were like living in like, a nice condo and going to your job, would it drive you crazy? Do you need to kind of live or mm -hmm. have a sort of divide in your life in that way? Or is it? I don't know if I need it. I was living in a nicer yeah. condo yeah. for about a for year. For a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's important for me because I don't want to forget my where I come from. I feel mm -hmm. like the more people you're exposed to, on a daily basis and the more lives you're living. I'm not saying you have to live a bunch of different lives, but I feel like I never want to lose touch with any realities, right? So I don't mm -hmm. wanna, the more people you meet, you develop a sense of empathy that I think our world is lacking. Yeah. And you understand why people do the things they do. And um, I think it's really important. I think that's one more reason I've always ridden the bus everywhere in every city. To just be able to yeah. see see it all. Yeah. Yeah. And you it's know, not necessarily pleasant, right, but right. <laughs> but I think it's important to not lose sight of that. What made you as a Yale, you know, you went to Yale, got your MFA at Yale. A lot of it seems to me like a lot of people who go to Yale, they either move to like New York or LA, but that's, or, and not just Yale, I mean, art schools in general, like yeah. what made you choose to stay in New Haven? I don't think my work here is done. I think this New Haven project, which I estimate is going to take approximately two to three years, mm -hmm. is, I think it's going to be a very important body of work. It's yeah. still so new, but I have to make it. And there are so many good pictures in New Haven. What Describe that to me. I find that fascinating because a lot of people wouldn't say like New Haven. It's got, there, there's so much to look at and so much to see. There's so much every minute, everywhere yeah. I look. Yeah. Like today, I was walking on the green by mm -hmm. the fountain. And so I was coming from Church Street. I'm bad with Northwest, whatever, but I was yeah. coming from Church Street, walking towards the fountain on the green. Yeah. And on the left side, to my left near the fountain, was four boys sitting and uh, on the fountain, and then one boy sitting, and when I say boy, I think they're probably 12, 13 years old. Yeah. And and they were they clearly knew each other. I couldn't tell if they were classmates or what but the one boy sitting on the bench across from the four boys on the the fountain he just had these he was he had a white shirt on and red pants that were a little too big and white socks pulled up and he just had this red hair and his face was so pale but he had these freckles and these bright blue eyes and the way he was sitting was just almost like he was posing it was like a photograph for me. And of course I didn't have a camera and I didn't want to be some <laughs> creepy person taking pictures of kids with their cell phones. But um, 
but that image was just he was so angelic like and, and it's funny. the way the boys were interacting with each other you know they were talking to him the boys on the fountain but this this red-headed boy was just posing almost it was and the light was hitting his face just this right way like the late summer light in new haven is incredible i mean the other morning i was walking to the bus stop I don't even know what was going on in this alley, but there was like a guy kind of laying on his side in the alley, and then there was a woman who was very thin, and she had like a black mini dress, very tight mm -hmm. on, and, and she had long black hair, and um, they, <laughs> I don't know what was going on in that alley. I just walked by, but then there was a moment where I was about 10, 15 feet away from them and I turned back and I looked at the woman who you know you could only see the man's legs and he mm -hmm. was in all white by the way mm -hmm. and the woman was standing straight up and her posture was so beautiful and she was turned toward the sun and it was this orangey glow and it was just illuminating her and her hair was jet black and so it was and kind of curly. Mm -hmm. And it was just the most beautiful image. That's cool. Of this person, these people in the alley, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't anything weird necessarily. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. it was kind of weird. But if mm -hmm. I had taken the image, it would have just been a beautiful portrait of this woman standing in the mm -hmm. morning mm -hmm. sun. Mm -hmm. And, and so, I mean, there's probably two to five times a day when I, I say, oh, wow, I wish I had photographed that. So for this New Haven project, I mean, you're just coming off of this project where you're manipulating people and the work is all in black and white. Mm. Um, do you view that project as a transition period to get, I mean, you talk about it as getting through a tough time and now you're ready to do this other project. Yeah. Do you think you're going to distort those images or is that the kind of thing where you're just ready to like take pictures of people again I think I'm without ready to Photoshop? Shoot. I'm ready yeah. to shoot. Um, I'm not ruling out Photoshop. I think it's way too early to tell yeah. what's going to happen and where it's going to go because yeah. it could go in a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. Um. I think I love that Photoshop experience that I had. So I think manipulation will be certainly we'll come incorporated in there. I don't know yeah. how. Mm -hmm. um, I think the tough part is going to just be, because there's been so much work made in New Haven recently and in this area. And so I have to figure out a sweet spot. And that's the tough part right now. Yes. You know, this is a very, very beginning phase. But right. I think... The important thing is I'm ready to start shooting. I'm going out there with my camera. I try to go daily, but yeah, you yeah. know, it's, yeah. it's still. And then there's something about photographing people who you live near, but you don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to invade, their, invade pri yeah. their privacy, especially since, you know, they're just living their lives like you're living yours. You know, we're all waiting for the bus stop here. <laughs> right. How do you think you can, you would negotiate that? This is going to be a much more uh, relationship building project. I mean, I had relationships with the other people, but there was a, a vehicle for introduction, whereas here I'll actually just have to make the introductions myself. So you're sort of laying the groundwork yeah. before even taking a photo. Exactly. I do document my walk to, sometimes I walk to and from work, so I'll photograph all the way to work till That's I get cool. in the office. Um, like, so from the time I leave my house, walk down State Street, cut across, and go into the building I work in and photograph up until I get into my cube. <laughs> I haven't looked That's at cool. You're working it into your schedule that way. I'm it's trying, nice. yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, when you're working full time, yeah. it's... It's tough. It's tough, but... I, I also just wanted to ask you about the, because I, I met you through your Peep Booth project that you did at Artspace where you built that. Is that how we met? Oh, that is, is how we met. Yeah, because you said, oh, you know, will you sit yeah. in the booth for a night? <laughs> <laughs> so I got to sit in your Peep Booth, but I just Yay. wanted to, yeah. Thanks for doing that. That was so awesome. Yeah. I wanted to just hear about, because we've talked a lot about, you know, what you're thinking about with your photography. Right. And it seems 
very related but um you know what was that what was that project about for you the peep booth so the, project and i guess describe what it is too right so the peep booth project is um at art space what early 2017 we mm-hmm. had built a peep booth and it was a dark it's what you would imagine a peep, peep booth would look like um you walk into a room there's a window it's dark. You can't see what's inside. There's a space that's lit, illuminated, and you can put money in. And when you put money in, the booth then becomes activated. Mm-hmm. And the light goes on, and I'm in the booth, or in your case, you were in the booth. Um, but mm-hmm. you can engage in a peep booth way. And I think it was a dollar a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. Next time I do something like this, I will charge more. Charge I will more, charge yeah. market rates. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the point is that, you know, here, and they were supposed to be artists in the peep booth. That was mm-hmm. the other thing. Mm-hmm. And so I was the artist. And I think it was really an interesting experience. It was a two way mirror. So I couldn't see who mm-hmm. was my customer. Mm-hmm. And different people came. I think I probably overall spoke to maybe 30 or 40 people over mm-hmm. the course of the, the period. Um, and it was, I was thinking about it from a lot of different points. I mean, the origin of it was a critique on the critique. I was in grad school, and the first instance I did of it was I, for my final, I had this peep booth and I had other videos and and photographs and things. Um, I think the big mistake with that peep booth was that I didn't charge them, mm. right? And so I had the opportunity to actually do it again. And right, at right. Art Space, I was uh, not at Crit, obviously, but at Art Space, I was able to charge people for it. And I, I just thought that artists give so much of themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, we we're such emotional people. We put so much work out mm-hmm. there, and our artwork often makes money for other people. Yeah. Not for us. And That's true. you split it with the gallerist. You know, it's mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. the perception of the rich artist is that doesn't happen too often. Not right? very it often. It can yeah. happen, but not too often. And and so I just kind of had this idea like, oh, what if the public did have to pay to talk to an artist and that was the artwork? How right. weird would that be? Yeah. And <laughs> and then there's also the sense of connecting with people in mm-hmm. this different way because mm-hmm. I've always photographed people who are very close to me. Well, not very close, but close to me, you know, mm-hmm. really. Um, and I love that idea, that the idea of intimacy and, and quiet moments with strangers was appealing to me. Yeah. And I like the safety of the peep booth. It also makes me think of something that seems to always be on your mind is that like negotiation of looking and like taking pictures of people Mm -hmm. and like when is it exploitative and when is it not exploitative? Right. You know? Yeah. Like I sort of see a similarity, like it's something that you're always thinking about on some level maybe. Yeah, I think so. And I, I mean, I think one of the things I loved about the peep show it was an agreement. Like mm-hmm. putting money in the booth, they were agreeing to our weird interaction. Yes. Yeah. I actually found it to be kind of a soothing. It was a weird environment to be in. I was going to ask you. Yeah. How, how was your experience in it? Was it hot? It was really hot. It was hot. hot, in hot there. <laughs> but it was a weird thing. It was weird not to see people, but know that you're being watched. Right. Because you felt alone in the booth. Like yeah. there wasn't, a, you could hear people talking and stuff. And some, there were a couple people who I knew that would say like, hey, it's me, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's odd to be performing, but not see people's eyes on you. Right. So there was a sense that you were in this space, like by yourself, just kind of hanging out but people were watching you at the same time. And that was odd because I'm, yeah, I'm so used to the, like the eye contact when you're like, because I do some performance stuff too. Like when you experience people, there's that, the butterflies in your stomach of like, oh God, like this person's like looking and connecting. And so it was interesting, right? To have, in, in some ways, have that pressure taken away. Yeah. Of having to confront somebody. 
I think that's one reason why I asked you in the peep booth, is because I knew that you had yeah. these interactions with the public. And right. So it's interesting now to hear your experience. So was it more yeah. soothing? It was more, more. It was more relaxing. soothing. Yeah, because even though people see you, you don't. I think when you make eye contact with another person, you have to imagine them seeing you. Yeah. Whereas. Well, you if have to engage. Yeah, you have to engage. A connection has to be made. Mm -hmm. And so in a funny way, the, the people on the other side of the glass who see me like looking forward are getting more intimacy from, from me than I'm getting from them. Yeah. You know? And I feel like it's like that. Mm -hmm. In in the peep booth situation, you know, yeah. the, the men go to see the women for yes. a certain fulfillment. Right. More so than, you know, I mean, yeah, sure, money is the, the exchange, but for the intimacy part of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little tongue in cheek, too, right? Right. Like it's, yeah. And the thing is, it's like, yeah, it's a peep booth, but... No nothing happens. Asked, yeah, nothing yeah. really happens. Yeah, you're just like looking at a person. It out of context, I actually yeah. had a gentleman come in thinking it was a real peep booth show. That is ridiculous. But he was so polite and he didn't even ask me. I mean, I probably wait, how would did that, have. Wait, how did it even get broached that he thought it was a real. Because it said peep show. But 6 he, to 8 p.m. But he came. No, I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> How did you discover that he came in with the intent for a peep show? Was he, like, asking you to... He wasn't asking me to do anything, but he, he at first he was, like, just trying to get to know me a little bit. And um, I think he was taken off guard because once he got into the space, he realized it wasn't an actual peep show. Right. So I think he was trying to figure out what was going on. And then toward the end, he was like... So he looked so, at the art space a, roster and was like, "This is great. There's a peep show at right. art space. I'm gonna." <laughs> yeah, and he was just so sweet. He was a very sweet guy, um, but yeah, I think he was the only person who thought it was a real peep show. But he still was. He didn't ask me to do anything. Yeah, and I think that's the other thing. I was, and maybe the environment. Maybe because it's not private enough from the viewer side to the outside. Yeah. There was nothing too um, scandalous. Mm -hmm. I think somebody asked me to do one or two poses for them, but it wasn't anything. Yeah, it wasn't weird. I, I oh yeah. sorry. No, please. I just think that a lot of folks didn't who came to my peep booth haven't been to real peep booth. Yeah, they didn't. So. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> so it's like a maybe foreign world to most people. Was it also, it also kind of mirrors like a camera light box or oh, I don't know, yeah. you know what I like mean? Like a Is camera it, obscura. Yeah. Were you thinking about it in that way? Um, I was really inspired by Paris, Texas. I mean, yeah. it's not a secret. It's like a blatant yeah. homage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some call it, I call it an homage. Maybe others won't. <laughs> That's funny. But it's an homage to Paris, Texas. Cool. And the people show scene there which i, I think see is Got one it. of the most even though it's a movie it's one of the most photographically stunning images i've ever seen you know mm -hmm. this blonde woman in a pink fluffy sweater gazing out at her lover yeah who, or her former lover yeah who's lost her you know and there's this yeah. space between them he can't touch her he can't hurt her anymore um but the lighting in that is just incredible and the dialogue is I highly recommend people to watch that if they haven't seen it. Thanks for coming on the first stop, Monique. This was a great conversation. Well, thank you. And I'm really glad to have been on the first stop. And uh, yeah, see you later. Remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. If you like the show, give us a good rating. And if you have a moment, write a review. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to Bruce Bart, director of WNHU, for providing the resources and guidance to make this podcast possible.